Hi there. Thanks for being here. So uh, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit first. I'm Leah. Hi, again. If you've ever heard my name before, it's probably due to one of my open source projects. It, these are the most popular ones, but there are more. You can find them on my GitHub page. By the way, my slides today are also on my GitHub profile, so uh, you don't need to keep lots of notes. All the demos are there. You can play with them. Uh, like uh, Fiona mentioned, I'm, a, I'm an invited expert in the CSS working group. I used to work full time for W3C, but now I'm spending my time writing a book for Riley about what else, CSS. And this September, I'm changing my career a little bit. I'm, I'm starting at MIT towards, uh, I'm going to study towards a PhD. Uh, so, enough about me. Let's go to more interesting things like how color works on screen. Um, so, this is a white pixel. Or this is more how most people imagine a white pixel uh, to, to look like. And we imagine that pixels are like these squares on our screen that have millions of different states for all the different colors, but the reality is a little bit different. And a white pixel looks more like this. There are three segments called subpixels, a red one, a green one, and a blue one. And all the different colors are created by uh, lighting those subpixels with different intensities. And actually, in our, in our LCD screens, they look a bit more like this. And you might be wondering, how, how on earth is this a white pixel? It just looks like three different colors to me. Well, yeah, if you look at it this closely, and with, at, at this magnification level, it doesn't really look like a white pixel. But if you start looking uh, from farther away, and they start getting smaller and smaller, you can see that the, your eyes start blending them together, and it starts looking like a sort of light gray. And if this wasn't a shitty CSS background and it was an actual screen, they would look like white. Uh, you can see here how subpixels light up with different intensities to create a few of the basic colors, and we can basically create any color just with these three subpixels. Uh, you can see how the subpixel geometry is different based on what type of screen uh, you're using. It's different on CRTs, different on LCDs, and this one is quite interesting, the bottom, the bottom left one, which, is, which doesn't exactly have subpixels, but every pixel has one of the basic, uh, is, is only one of the basic colors, either red or green or blue. So the actual, uh, th this is from the project One Laptop Per Child, which tried to reduce the costs of creating a laptop as much as possible so that children in poor countries could get a laptop for $100. I'm sure you've heard about it. Uh, so the way they found to reduce costs on screens was instead of having some pixels, every pixel is one of the primary colors. And what I found really interesting about this uh, innovation is that the actual resolu the perceived resolution of the screen even depends on the viewing angle. It, it's a really interesting uh, it, it's really interesting and really different from any other screen we're used to. And even in LCD screens, the subpixel geometry is slightly different. You can see here how it compares between an iPad or a different model of iPad or an, an iPhone or an, uh, an Asus ePad transformant tablet. And every, every subpixel usually, everything that I say today has exceptions, but every subpixel usually is, uh, needs eight bits, which means to, uh, 24 bits per pixel, which is three bytes per pixel, which you can verify by finding uh, with every uncompressed image, like a bit, every bitmap image, for example, these are uncompressed. If you multiply the width by the height by three, you can generally find the file size of the, of the file. It's slightly different because it, has, it also has some metadata, but this is pretty much the, the size of the file. And this means that you can create 256 to the third possible colors which is around 16.7 million, just with these eight bits per subpixel. And quite often, uh, we need to represent vector graphics on screen, and parts of these graphics don't fall on, on, on exact pixels, like a pixel might be 50% covered or 30% covered. So how do you represent that? Uh, there are two techniques, and this, this is uh, representing these um, vector graphics on, on a finite grid of pixels is called anti-aliasing. The basic anti-aliasing technique is called grayscale anti-aliasing, and it looks like this. Every pixel is lit up. The whole pixel is either uh, lit up by the percentage of coverage it has, or 
completely turned off. Uh, and there's also another technique called sub-pixel anti-aliasing, where, for example, this pixel was 50% covered uh, on the right-hand side, so the blue sub-pixel is completely lit up, the green one is about 50% lit up, and the red one is almost turned off, which basically triples the horizontal resolution of uh, the screen. The actual perceived resolution is a bit lower than three times because our eyes are more sensitive to certain subpixels. And also it depends on the subpixel geometry of the screen. If, uh, if the anti-aliasing algorithm um, is based on the fact that uh, red is before green, uh, that red is on the left side and blue is on the right side and your screen actually has blue on the left side and red on the right side, then it will be completely messed up. It will be even worse than grayscale anti-aliasing. And WebKit browsers do have a proprietary property to, con to, to control how this works for fonts. Uh, you can turn off some pixel anti-aliasing because some people don't like it. I would advise you not to use it. It's, it's proprietary and it's awful. Most people, anti-aliasing, some um, pixel anti-aliasing is much better when it's available. Sometimes it's not available when you have like 3D transforms, the browser turns it off because it's too complicated. And I'm sure you've looked at fonts, uh, if you've looked at fonts close enough, if, uh, when they were using some pixel anti-aliasing, you must have seen these pixels that even though your, font, your text color was black, uh, the, the pixels on the edges were like different colors, like shades of red, shades of green, uh, of blue. Uh, as you can see here. And this is exactly because of subpixel anti-aliasing. Uh, as you can see here, this is how the different subpixels are covered. And this is how they end up looking because depending on how the subpixels are lit up, they correspond to different colors. And you can see as I move the font, uh, so the pixels fall on different subpixels, how these colors on the edges change. I think that's quite interesting. Uh, and now let's move on to how color uh, works with code. Uh, so this section is mostly about uh, color in CSS uh, and what's coming in CSS color level four. But in the beginning, in the firstly, we'll start with a historical overview of how we ended up to color to CSS color level four, and some things that are in CSS color level three and aren't very popular. So this is how the RGB color model is often represented geometrically. It's every color model has a geometrical representation because it's useful for a number of things like finding the distance between two colors. Although as we'll see later, the distance between colors in the RGB cube is not exactly useful. Uh, and because our screens are two dimensional, so we can't, uh, a, a cube is not exactly usable we tend to flatten the cube into, two dim into uh, one dimension that we keep constant, which in this case, in this slide is red, and you can see the, the range of possible colors in the other plane. And this is like the best kind of color pickers that you can find where they only flatten one dimension. There are also color pickers where the, uh, they flatten all three dimensions and you get three sliders, try to avoid those. So, uh, a little historical overview before we get into the meat of this talk. Uh, we, fr we first got colors in HTML 3.5, and there were, there were two kinds of, co of color formats we could use. Mainly hex colors that looked like this, and as you know, the first two digits are red, the second, the, uh, the second two digits, the, um, the third and the fourth digits represent green, the last two are blue, this particular color is this one, which is my favorite color. However, no, nobody thinks, okay, so we have um, RGB 255 and 0 and 90, so 255 corresponds to FF, and then 0 is a 0, 0. And what about 90? Yeah, that's, that's 5 times 16 plus 10, so 5A. Nobody, ever. <laughs> what we end up doing is using color pickers finding a hex value, copying it into our CSS, and then when we need to modify it, we don't even use JavaScript. Like, we, we could co convert hex to decimal and vice versa with a, single, with, a, with a line of JavaScript, but usually we don't do that. We just have this value in our CSS code, and we end up 
thinking, oh, I want to make it darker, so I'll just subtract something from all components. Let, let's try 33 to make it darker. So I'll, I'll subtract 33 and do something like this, and then something, uh, yeah, that, that, should, that should be it. And then we end up with a hue that's slightly different than what we had in mind, but we go with it because we're too lazy to go back to the color picker, and it, it, we can't... We can't quite modify it from the CSS, and it's a, it's a complete mess. And of course, we got these extremely useful CSS color names. <laughs> Does anybody know where these color names come from? They come from the Windows VGA palette. Remember that? When you restarted in safe mode and you only had 16 colors? It was these 16 colors. So in HTML 3.2, we only had hex colors, confusing and cryptic and color names that are mostly useless. So then we got CSS, and actually CSS came slightly after HTML 3.2. HTML 3.2 was 96, CSS 1 was in 97. However, it took a few more years for browsers to actually implement it in a decent way so we could start using it. And I'm, I'm saying here CSS 1 to 2.1 because we, there weren't any changes uh, color-wise between CSS 1 and 2.1. So, we got an RGB color format. We, it was still not in, very intuitive because RG, RGB was designed for machines because that's how some pixels work. It wasn't designed for humans. So if we want to make like an orange color, we, we don't usually think, okay, I want some red and then I don't want any blue, but I do want some green. How much green? Yeah, something like this. That's not how humans think. But anyway, this was one step better than hex colors. And we also got percentages in RGB. So for the aforementioned orange, we could do something like this and then increase this and see what kind of shade we want, which is a little bit, less, best, uh, a little bit more usable than values from 0 to 255. But because we were so used to thinking in terms of powers of 2 from 0 to 250, uh, 255, we, no, this, this notation never caught up, even though old browsers support it. And we got three-digit hex codes, which were basically just as confusing as six-digit hex codes, but at least they were shorter. So this, is, <laughs> so this is just a shorthand for this, as you all know. And we got a new named color, orange. <laughs> How extremely useful this is. So these are the new color formats we got in CSS1 until 2.1. The RGB, the RGB function notation, the, the, the three-digit hex code, and the orange named color. <laughs> I've actually made a game that I was planning to play uh, here that you can test how, uh, how quickly you can guess a color if you're using RGB or if you're using any other notation. And I'm not actually going to play this until I find the color because that's not how uh, it's not exactly easy to do that while you're on stage. <laughs> but I think you should try it at home because it's quite interesting. Yeah, I'm getting kind of close, but I have to go, go, give up now and move to the next slide. <laughs> yeah, almost there. Next. So, colors in CSS, uh, in CSS color level three. That was a big one. We got many new color formats. But before I move forward, this is some JavaScript that I, will, uh, that, that, that I will use as a base for describing uh, methods that modify colors. This doesn't, at this stage, it doesn't do much. It just uh, generates color objects, and there's a getter and setter to get an RGB array and an alpha value, but it doesn't really do much. And you can create colors this way by providing an RGBA array, or in this way by, by using the RGB setter, and you can add methods like this. For example, this is a simple invert method that inverts a color uh, by subtracting its RGB value from 255. Just keep this in mind because we'll need it moving forward. So, in CSS color level three, we got a, a, a model that is a little bit more intuitive for humans to understand. It's called HSL. It depends on hue, which is like the basic color value, is it orangish, is it reddish, is it bluish? Uh, what's the basic color value? And then saturation, how, how close it is to gray. And then lightness, which is how close it is to white or how close it is to black, which makes it much easier to pick a color. For example, if I wanna pick an orange, I know that it's not close to the center, it's more towards this edge. 
and then I can make it lighter or darker. It's, it's, it's a little bit closer to how humans think. We, we, it's, it's natural to say I want a red with some yellow uh, that's, that's somewhat, somewhat muted, it's a little bit close to gray, and it's kind of light than, mi than mixing red, green, and blue. And you can see, as I'm sure you've all used HSL colors, there's, uh, they, they have three parameters. Uh, the, the second one is saturation, the third one is lightness, and the first one is the hue, uh, which is basically the only thing we have to memorize to use HSL colors, how the different hues work. Everything else we can just figure out by uh, knowing how light we want our color or how gray our color is. And HSL is just a, 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 a transformation of RGB into cylindrical coordinates. It's still RGB, it's not a different color space. The colors it can generate are exactly the same as RGB. Uh, and it's often, uh, its geometrical representation is a cylinder, uh, which is a, a, a circle for the values of hue, and then uh, the height is for lightness, and the radius is for saturation, but it's actually more of a cone, a double cone. This is only half of it because as we move towards values of zero or values of one, you can see that at lightness 100% or at lightness 0%, we can only get one color, black or white. And as we move towards the edges of this lightness slider, we get fewer and fewer colors, which is why it's more accurately depicted as a cone and not a cylinder. And this is the game again. You should try it with HSL as well and see how much faster you'll be uh, and knowing how HSL works is not just useful for, uh, for picking colors per se, but also for filters, because we can use the Hue Rotate filter, for example, which is supported by Chrome and Safari, and you can also sort of have it in Firefox with an SVG filter, but it's a more complex syntax. So uh, here, I've used the Hue Rotate filter by 60 degrees, which means every pixel on this, on this image will have its hue rotated by 60 degrees. So if it's yellow, which means uh, a hue of 60, it will become 120, which is green, which is why it's sort of greenish, because my, my default picture was, like, was, was a little yellowish like this. And, it's, and if the hue rotate filter is really useful in combination with other filters, because if I use a sepia filter, it's sort of grayish yellow, so I can use a saturate filter as well to make it more yellowish. And then I can use a hue rotate filter to make it whatever color I want. So I can effectively colorize an image. If I make it 120, it becomes more like aqua, and you can see all the different colors it gets. Although, to be fair, there's also another way to colorize images by using blending modes. So here I've used a background color of, um, of uh, magenta, basically, and uh, light magenta, and a, and a blending mode of multiply, which creates this effect. If this is white, which is 100% lightness, it's exactly the same image as I had to begin with. Otherwise, it blends, uh, it blends pixel, the pixels together in, in this way. So, what the multiply filter basically does is that it multiplies together the components of both colors. Uh, they need to be on, this, on a zero to one uh, scale before, obviously, before they're multiplied, otherwise you'll get a huge number. So I've divided them by 255 to make them on a zero to one scale, and then multiplied by them by 255 to make them a real RGB color. But this is basically how it works, which is where the name multiply comes from this blending mode that I'm sure if any of you has ever used Photoshop blending modes, uh, this is like the most popular one, multiply. And the reason the image gets so much darker uh, it, but when you use this blending mode, remember when I used like this color uh, with, the, with the blending mode of multiply, you can see how it got so much darker. And the reason for that is, this is an example of using multiply to blend red and blue together. Can you imagine, uh, can you think based on the algorithm above what kind of color it would generate? So 255 for red would be multiplied by zero here, and then 255 for blue would be multiplied by the zero for the red, so you would end up with black. So when using multiply, you always end up with darker colors. Um, 
Every color is at least as dark as the darkest color you have. And there, are, there, there is uh, multiply, but there are many other blending modes as well, which you can see here in this awful graphic, which looks horrible. <laughs> but it showcases what you can, what's possible with blending modes. And as you can see, I've used Chrome, I've used Firefox, they worked in both. They, they're, although in Firefox, you, they, they require a flag to be enabled, no, and in Chrome. So currently they're experimental because you need to turn on a flag to use them, but soon enough, and there are things that, these are things that you can use uh, and they degrade pretty gracefully. So as long as they're in a browser, you can just use them and uh, browsers that don't support blending modes will just get the regular version of an image, which is not like, uh, which is not a horrible thing because you usually use blending modes for some sort of image effect. They're not crucial for functionality. Anyway, back to HSL. HSL seemed much better than RGB, and everybody was raving about it a few years ago when it was introduced. But do you see here one of the problems with HSL? So one of the big problems with HSL is that lightness is not really lightness. So here we have yellow, which is a really light color, and blue, which is a, really, a quite dark color, but they both have the same value of lightness. Uh, and the reason for that is that RGB does not have this property called perpetual uniformity. Perpetual uniformity is when the perceptual similarity of two colors is measured by the distance between them. Remember the RGB cube in the beginning? If the RGB color space was perceptually uniform, you could measure the, the distance between two points in the cube, uh, and the Euclidean distance between these two points would represent how different they are. So it would be really easy to, to, de to determine how similar two colors are. But RGB is not perceptually uniform, and neither is HSL, because HSL is just RGB. It's just an easier way to refer to RGB, but it has the same flaws. And you can see the same problem here with RGB. Both the first and the, th and the third color have exactly the same distance from the second one, which is just fuchsia. But as you can see, the, th the third one looks much more different than the first and second ones. You can see in the, in the cube here that Basically, fuchsia is this point, and then the other colors were this midpoint and this midpoint. So they have exactly the same distance, it's 128. But the, uh, the perceived distance is much different, is very different. So, uh, if we used the HSL lightness to determine how light the color is, for example, to, de to decide if we should put black text on it or white text, we would end up with pretty strange results, like white text on yellow or black text on blue. And the reason for that is that this is how lightness is calculated. If we wanted to add a lightness getter to our color class, uh, class, JavaScript uh, doesn't exactly have classes, uh, you, the, the, color, the code would look like, a little like this. As you can see, you're getting the maximum of the RGB component, the, the of components, the minimum of the RGB components, and then you're returning the average of, these, of this minimum and maximum in the right scale, zero to 100. So, do you notice something here? It doesn't matter whether this maximum or minimum is blue or red or, or green. It doesn't account for differences uh, between, the, between red, green, and blue at all. However, our eyes are much more sensitive to blue and, uh, than red and much more sensitive to red than green. We see that green is much lighter than red, which is also much lighter than blue. And this is why we end up with these really weird lightness values for colors that are obviously not as dark or light as uh, the lightness value says. There is another measure called relative luminance, which is much better, although it also, it's also imperfect, but it's much better for this sort of thing. And I don't expect you to memorize, or, uh, to, to memorize this algorithm. I'm, I've just put it up there to show you that it's not something complicated, it's just a few lines of code. And mainly, the brilliance of relative luminance is the return statement here, as you can see, red is weighed differently than green, which is weighed differently than blue. Uh, relative luminance accounts for the differences between these three components, which is why it yields much more accurate values. So this, in this slide, uh, I can enter a color value and, and see the luminance and lightness values, and depending on whether they're above or below 50, uh, 50 uh, it, it also sets the text color for this and this. So if I use yellow, 
you can see that luminance is 93%, uh, which is much closer than what we'd expect. White, by the way, is 100%. Black is 0%. So yellow is much closer to white, which is something we'd expect. And as you can see, lightness yields this really weird 50% result. And similarly, blue is, is, 50, uh, is 7%, which is much closer to black than, than to white. So it, it, it fits much, much closer what we, would, uh, what we would think. But it's not perfect. As you can see here, uh, if I enter orange, lumin relative luminance is 48%, uh, which, and it, 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 which yields a, a, a text color of white. But it would be much better with a text color of, of black. So it should, it should really be above 50%. But at least with relative luminance, you don't get the, the, the kind of awful uh, mistakes as lightness. And relative luminance is used in the color contrast definition in the web accessibility guidelines. This is exactly the formula for calculating color contrast. You just get the two luminances and basically find the ratio between them. The only reason it's adding 0 0.05 per, uh, to each of them is just so that you don't let, end up dividing by zero. And uh, when I was working at W3C, I had to pass web, the web accessibility guidelines every time I made anything. Am I connected to the internet? I should be. Uh, so I had to pass the web accessibility guidelines every time I made anything, and all the existing uh, tools for measuring contrast ratio needed hex colors, and I guess you've figured out by now I don't really like hex colors very much, even though I'm so used to them that sometimes you'll see me using them as well. But they're really not very, they're, they're not very intuitive. So I had to copy the CSS values I was using in my style sheet, which were like HSL values or whatever, convert them to, to, H, uh, to, to hex, and then uh, use these tools until I got fed up and made my, and made my own tool, which also accounts for transparency, which is not as simple as it seems. So when you have a, a semi-transparent text color, it's, it's easy to, make, to measure the contrast ratio because when you put it on an opaque background color, you basically get two opaque colors. So you can, you can, measure, out the, you can measure the contrast ratio between them. But what happens if, if it's the background color that's semi-transparent? Because then the contrast ratio be, depends on what you have underneath. So, so you can't really get a single contrast ratio value. It's a range. So I, I did this plus minus thing. And as you can see, the range becomes bigger as the transparency becomes smaller. Uh, and I had to do my own research on this because the web accessibility guidelines didn't have anything about transparency. Nobody, apparently nobody had even considered the, the fact that you might have semi-transparent colors. It just was completely out of their mind of, of whoever wrote those guidelines. Uh, so, like I said, uh, I mentioned semi-transparent colors earlier, and this, the, this, uh, this is another thing we got with CSS Color Level 3. Uh, we got semi-transparent colors, and I'm sure you, you were all really excited when we got semi-transparent colors. Every developer was. And they work with, oh, uh, as you know, they work with both HSL and uh, RGB. But have you ever wondered how they actually work? Because our screen doesn't have transparent pixels. What would you see, the circuits behind the screen? So everything needs to be composited into opaque pixels. And this is, called with a process, this is done with a process called alpha blending. So this is how alpha blending would work if we, would, if, we, if, we, if we were to implement it in JavaScript. Obviously, our screen doesn't implement it in JavaScript. It's probably in assembly. But this is the main idea uh, behind it. You multiply every, every color component with its own alpha, and uh, also if it's the color underneath by one minus the alpha of the color above. And then obviously the alpha increases accordingly, because if you have like a 50% red above, uh, on top of 25% uh, blue, you would obviously get like a, uh, an alpha that's bigger than 50% for the final color. And similarly to alpha blending is color interpolation, which is mixing two colors together uh, by a certain weight. If the weight is 50%, it's basically the average of these two colors. It's much easier than the, the, than the algorithm for alpha blending. And also, unlike the algorithm for alpha blending, this gives you exactly the same results, regardless of which color is first. Uh, so you're, you just multiply every component of the color by the weight. 
and uh, then the, the, the other color by one minus the weight, which is basically 100% minus the weight you have. So if, you have, if the weight is 50%, which is the, av the, the average between th these colors, the weight is, uh, you multiply every component by 50%, because this would also be 50%. And SAS supports this natively by the, by, you, by the function called mix. You can provide two colors and a percentage, and it does exactly this. But color interpolation is not just used for colors. Uh, it's also, it's exactly how gradients work. You start with, for example, in this gradient, you start with white, you go towards black, and every color in between is calculated by the, by the same algorithm. And this is really simple when you have a color, a gradient from white to black. But what happens, what happens when, when you have a gradient, for example, from white to transparent? Transparent is just a shortcut to RGBA with all zeros. So as our color is transitioning from white to, uh, from, from uh, completely opaque to completely transparent, it's also transitioning from white to black. So you can, you can see this more clearly if I add a white background as well. This is not white uh, that we got here. We were expecting to get solid white because we had white to transparent on white. So what would you expect to get? I would expect to get just a solid white, but that's not the case. And the reason for that is that this is, this is how the intermediate colors look. For example, the midpoint, you get this 50% transparent gray. To get uh, the intended effect, you should use a transparent version of white, which in, you could either provide with HSLA or RGBA. And you can see the difference here, which should make it really clear in case you couldn't see it earlier. Uh, however, this is not needed anymore for every browser. This is mainly needed today for Firefox, because uh, the spec changed after people started using gradients from colors to transparent. We realized that this is not what authors expected. This, this is like a major WTF. What's going on here? Why do I have this gray in my gradient? So we changed the, well, uh, Tab Atkins changed the, the way uh, color interpolation works. Uh, and now it's supposed to happen what, in what's called a pre-multiplied RGBA space, which means every color is stored multi after it's multiplied by its alpha value. So you can't have a, a transparent black anymore. You can just have transparent. So uh, if, you, if you test the same gradient in Chrome, uh, you will see that it's, it, these two gradients are exactly the same. As you can see, now I loaded it in Chrome, and these gradients are exactly the same because Chrome uses a pre-multiplied uh, pre RGBA space for, the, for color interpolation. And we also got more named colors, which weren't exactly evenly distributed or easy to use. You can see these are, these are so long that it would be uh, more efficient to just use uh, an RGB notation, and they're not exactly like, easy to remember. Who, who would remember li light golden rod yellow? Or some of them were even really weird to understand why they produce the shade they produce. Or orchid, for example, is a flower with multiple colors. Why did they pick this one? Or old lace. My, my, I've seen laces that are different. Or all these are really strange. And then you get the ones that are even racist. <laughs> And then there's the completely insane. <laughs> if you're wondering, by the way, how on earth did we end up with this, it's because uh, gray was one of the first 16 colors we got, if you remember, with HTML 3.2. So we already had gray, and it already meant that, because that's what it meant in the Windows VGA palette. But then when we got all these new color names, these came from X11, and X11 also had a gray named color with a different shade of gray that was actually lighter than this dark gray. But we couldn't change gray because so many websites were already using it. So we ended up adop adopting dark gray, but gray remained the way it was, which is why we ended up with this. We also got a really useful um, color name that's very different from the color names I already shown. So I'm sure if, you, if you've, you've definitely tried 
using a border without a color, and you know that it defaults to the text color. So here, if I change the text color, it just gets, the border just gets the text color as well. What on earth is this? Uh, many properties have the same behavior. For example, box shadow. If I specify box shadow without a color, it, it gets the text color. If I change the text color, that changes as well. Similarly, text shadow also gets the text color. There are a few of these properties that work in that way. Uh, let's go back to border. So, uh, in CSS 2.1, uh, this behavior was described in every property that, that, that had this behavior. It, uh, the text said, if there's no color provided, it should, it should get the text color or something like that. In CSS color level three, we got a keyword that specifies this behavior, and it's called current color. It comes from SVG. SVG had this before CSS. And uh, by the way, it's current color with, a U, uh, with an O, not with a U. This doesn't work. Uh, I've, I've once written an article for a British magazine, so they Britified all my words, and they added a U in current color, <laughs> and it ended up not working. Fun times. So uh, you might be wondering, since all these properties have this behavior by default, how is this useful? First off, it's useful when you want to override something, when you have a red border and you want to override it with the default behavior. But it's also useful for other things like backgrounds. So assume I want to have a background, which is like scan lines that take the, the text color. So I would do something like this and specify a background size that's sort of smaller. And I would get something like this. I could even modify the size of the scan lines by modifying the color stop positions. And then if I change this to whatever color I please, it automatically Changes. Current color is basically the first variable we got in CSS. We will eventually get real variables. There's a spec about it. It's called custom properties. But don't, don't be misled by the name. They're basically, they basically uh, are like variables. They're more than variables, actually, because they can be used like properties. But they can also be used like variables. But anyway, until this is implemented, current color is the first and only CSS variable we have today. And it's really useful for things like decorations and pseudo elements, for example, especially when you don't have any text. So you can just specify a color value that's not gonna be seen in any text anywhere, and then just use color, current color as, uh, as a variable, basically. So to sum up, in CSS color level three, we got HSL, better but not great. RGBA and HSLA, which were badly needed. More color names, still mostly useless and current color, which is really cool, but sort of limited. And then comes CSS color level four. Everything I'm gonna say from this point is really tentative. The syntax might change. The functionality probably will be implemented in one way or another, but the syntax might change because the spec is currently in, in editor's draft. Uh, and some of them are more stable than others. So the first thing is gray will become a function. So the, fu the, the gray keyword is equivalent to 50%, and we'll be able to adjust this parameter to whatever value we please. And it will also accept values from uh, 100 to uh, 255, just like RGB, but percentages are better. And you can also provide an alpha value, so you can use it for, for anything white, black, transparent, gray, anything of that sort, which is like 50% at least of the colors we use in websites. Uh, you can use gray today with SAS by if you implement it like this. And it's exactly the same syntax as CSS has. It's just one line of SAS. And if you were wondering about the RGBA function, uh, if it's an opaque color, SAS takes care of that automatically and it just converts it to a hex color for the browser. We will also get four digit hex colors. People have been asking them for, age, uh, for them for ages. Uh, even, though, even though hex is not exactly intuitive, we'll, we're so used to it that it seems more intuitive to us than other color formats sometimes, just because we've been using it for years. 
so the, the fourth digit, the first three digits will be exactly the same as a three digit hex code and the last digit will be an alpha trans, uh, the alpha transparency. So F will be completely transparent, zero will be completely opaque, and then you can figure out what the rest will mean. And of course, we will also get, as you can imagine, eight digit hex codes, which will look like, let's say, like this. I'm just writing a, a random color now. I have no idea what this will produce. So you can have colors like this, because people have been asking for this as well. It looks like a damn, uh, like a fucking serial number, <laughs> but people have been asking for this for ages. So eventually we caved in and added it. Uh, we will also get, uh, at least it's, it's sort of planned right now, eventually this might change. So this is, there's a color model called HWB, which is different than uh, what Photoshop uses and calls it HSP, and it's also different from HSL. It's a little more similar to, S to HSP than HSL, and it basically means hue. hue. Hue is the same as it is for, H for HSL, and then the other two are whiteness and blackness. So basically, you get a base, a base hue, the one you get with HSL 100% for saturation and 50% for lightness, and then you mix it with white and black, and it looks, the syntax will look like this. So I can mix it, with white and make a, a, a lighter color, and I can mix it with black and make a darker color, and if I mix it with equal amounts of white and black, I get a sort of achromatic color which doesn't have any hue. And I can emulate HWB with SAS, uh, and I, I actually came up with this slide like uh, a few hours ago, uh, but you can emulate uh, HWB with, uh, with, with SAS, uh, what this is doing, it's, it ta it's taking the base HSL uh, hue, like I said, and then it modifies it according to the whiteness and blackness you've specified. It's not exactly the same as, HS uh, as um, CSS uh, will be, because in CSS, if you specify whiteness and blackness that add up to more than 100%, they will be more normalized, and this doesn't have any normalization, and also it doesn't have an alpha value, which CSS will have, but that's easy to add and you use it like this, and SAS will convert it to, to a hex code. And this is basically the same syntax you will use in CSS eventually, so SAS in this case ends up acting like a polyfill. We will also got a color manipulation function called color, which we can specify a base color here, well, which can be whatever. Here I use the color name, but it could be uh, any color. It could be this uh, or anything, uh, even a variable when we eventually get them, and then have a number of color adjusters like tint, which makes it lighter, shade, which makes it darker, or even blend, which mixes it with another color. You can see how this works here. Remember the mix function in SAS? This is essentially what blend will do. And there are a number of other adjusters to do all sorts of things. Uh, you can emulate tint and SAS and shade in SAS already, just with a line of code. The syntax is different in, in this case than in CSS, but it's, it's still the same thing. Uh, the output is the same, and if you're using bourbon, these are all, tint and shade are already included. And there's a preprocessor called Methio that implements color manipulation in this way with the color function, so it acts a bit like a polyfill. So to sum up, and these are, there are a few here that I haven't mentioned, uh, in CSS color level four, as it looks right now, this is very tentative, we'll get gray, we'll, we'll get a gray function. Uh, four and eight digit hex codes, HWB, the color uh, adjustment function, named hues and angles in HSL. For example, instead of saying 60, we'll be able to say yellow or 60 degrees. And RGB and HSL will accept alpha values, a fourth parameter, so we won't have to change the function name and add an A every time we want to use a semi-transparent color. And before I leave you, uh, here is a snippet of code to parse any supported CSS color because some of you write tools. For example, uh, I wrote a tool that converts between different CSS color formats and people end up trying to parse every color format available. They, they, they're parsing CSS colors and they're parsing HSL colors. You don't really need to do all that. You can just let the browser do it for you. So you can create a dummy element set its color, then read it back to see if, if it was retained, because if it wasn't retained, it wasn't valid. And then 
append it to somewhere in the document. You can even append it in the head. It doesn't need to be visible for this use case. Read its computed style, remove it, clean up after yourselves, and then parse what you got back, which will only be RGB or RGBA. So you can then just parse the RGBA and create a color value. You don't have to account for all the possible values that the browser understands, which could be like named colors. For example, this is the tool I created for converting between different colors. And as you can see, I've entered a, a color name here and it just it converted it by using this trick. So that's about it. Thank you very much. I hope you learned something useful.